in collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up on today's programme, a British woman who makes halloumi cheese in Australia. It's pretty good and the customers really like it. They can tell the difference between the halloumi I make and the halloumi that we buy from the supermarkets. A book on the spiders of Cyprus will be launched next week. It has a local name, Rova Discofis, which means the nipple of the viper. And it turns out that it belongs to the Cyprus Black Widow. Deep Purple prepare to perform in the occupied areas. I don't wish to interfere in anyone's affairs. And I don't wish also uh, for offence to be taken where none is intended. The Minister of Communications talks about broadband in Cyprus and its role in our economic growth. Uh, for a start, I have to say that uh, we are talking about a major destruction of the civil service. If we don't implement the technology part, we are not going to be able to do that. Next Wednesday at the University of Nicosia, there's the launch of a book called 60 Cypriot Spiders. No, I know it possibly isn't your favourite subject, but it's very definitely a favourite with my next guest. He is Duncan McCowan, who's put the book together. Duncan, thanks for joining me. Only 60, or did you pick 60 out of rather more? Uh, it's a good question, Rosie. No, um, there are many... Uh, spiders in Cyprus, many more than 60. Uh, I just thought that um, originally, in fact, I was going to go for 50 because I thought that was a digestible number. But in compiling the book, more and more photographs from friends, etc., of other species came in. And so I thought it's such a shame to leave these particular spiders out. So I decided to extend it from 50 to 60 because I thought that's a palatable number. You don't want to um, drown people in spiders. Uh, probably not at all. I mean, most people can't stand spiders. Actually, mm. I'm rather fond of most of them. But who are you expecting to buy this book? Because it certainly won't appeal to the vast majority of the population. Well, I don't know, actually, because I think that a lot of people have a curious relationship with spiders. You find that very few people are indifferent to spiders. You either... I, I wouldn't say anybody loves them, necessarily, apart from a few eccentrics that I happen to know, but um, most people, yeah, are curiously phobic about spiders, but I think anybody who has any kind of phobia is kind of fascinated by it, and I think... Spiders are fascinating creatures, and uh, so I think the book ought to appeal to anybody who um, is interested in the nature of Cyprus and the, the makeup of, of animals that, uh, that live here. Well, it's certainly got lots of pictures, lots of facts and figures and so on. How long did it take you to find them all and put it all together? Well, yeah, it actually did take a long time. I actually began the book about ten years ago. And uh, for a small book, that's quite an achievement, I think, yeah, that it's taken so long to, to produce. But I've done it in my spare time. And the other thing is, is that, yes, getting the photographs together for each species isn't as easy as it sounds, because I, I wanted all the photographs to be taken in Cyprus. So they are all portraits of um, spiders that are authentically taken here. But, of course, actually, the first thing you have to do is actually find the spider. Mm. And then, of course, if you find the spider, it's not guaranteed it's going to hang around for a portrait photograph. So that's another one of the, the problems. Did it take you long to find all these spiders? I mean, were there any particularly difficult ones that you knew you wanted to include and you couldn't locate? That's a very good question. I think I was helped in, in many ways, especially by um, a good friend, Christodoulos McCreese, who's a terrific nature photographer, one of the best anywhere, in fact, and he produced the butterflies of Cyprus, and we're pals, and he would go out looking for butterflies. In fact, he looks for everything. There's nothing that escapes his lens. And um, if he saw a spider, he would, he would take a photograph of it and then send it to me for an identification. And if I, as most often would happen, I couldn't identify it, I'd then send it to my pals who are abroad, especially in Britain, and, um, and they would 
give a name for the spider. So a lot of the species came to me from that route. Other spiders, to answer your question, I don't think there was a a particular spider um, that I was hunting for the book, but there there are and have been many spiders that I knew were likely to be resident in Cyprus that I would go out and specifically look for, yes. Lurking under stones and in out-of-the-way places. Let's come to the favourite of yours in the book. Is there a favourite? I mean, you say that you don't love them as such and you're more fascinated, I suppose. Mm. But are, are there any of them in the book that you, can we say, warm to? Well, there are... In the world of spiders, there are so many different characters. I mean, really, honestly, once you become familiar with them and watch their, observe their behaviour and learn other things about them, I suppose you could develop favourites. Um, in a way, I suppose I ought to pay homage to the Cypress Black Widow because, in a sense, that's how the whole book began. I, I began with uh, what I would say is an ordinary interest in spiders, uh, a sort of schoolboy interest in spiders, and come to Cyprus, I, I suspected we had interesting spider fauna, but I didn't actually know, that, uh, like a lot of people, that we had seriously venomous spiders in Cyprus, which we do have. And so, in many ways, the book began with my first discovering that particular spider. I mean, it's just a personal discovery. It wasn't a discovery for science. And then finding out other um, sort of folklore, lo- local stories about that particular spider. And in trying to discover, um, it has a local name, Rova Disgufis, which means the nipple of the viper. And that particular name, when I first heard of it, I didn't know precisely to which spider it belonged. So part of the book, and I write in the book, is part of the sort of... um, Folklore and the history. Yeah, trying to uh, attribute that name to a particular spider. And it turns out that it belongs to the Cypress Black Widow, let's say. And it does have an interesting um, folk history in Cypress, yeah. Where's the book available? How much does it cost? Well, it's uh, 15 euros... And it's available uh, at uh, reputable bookshops. Uh, um, Online? It's going to be available through Amazon. And, uh, and I, I should say it's published by Mikrogiklos uh, Books, which is um, from Kiriakou Books in Limassol, where, of course, anybody who happens to be in Limassol, it's very much available there, Kiriakou Books. And I must say thank you very much to... Um, to Mr Kiriakos Kiriakou for his enthusiasm, encouragement and help in bringing the the book to publication. And Duncan McCowan will be giving a presentation of his book, 60 Cypriot Spiders, at the University of Nicosia's UNESCO room at 7.30 on Wednesday evening. Keep up to date with events and news in Cyprus with the Cyprus News Digest. You can stream it live on mycyradio.eu, listen again on the Cyprus Mail website, or download the podcast to your phone or tablet and listen anytime, anywhere. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about how you make halloumi, and of course we've had so much in the press recently about what exactly is the recipe for halloumi as Cyprus decides whether to apply for a special recognition for its undoubtedly very special cheese. Well, with me today we have on the programme a British lady who used to live in Cyprus in the 1990s, who's moved to Australia, where she runs Café Yasu, and she makes her own halloumi. She is Anne Ryan. Anne, what on earth possessed you to go and find out how to make halloumi, and how does it go down in your café? Because I have a slight... A Greek influence in the cafe. I like to serve halloumi and lamb and halloumi when I first introduced it um, we were able to buy it from the supermarket. It was not very well known but uh, over the years it's becoming more popular and there was a local cheese maker making all sorts of cheese. They do classes and one of the classes was halloumi so I decided to go along and see how we make halloumi in Australia. I was 
thinking that halloumi was only ever made with goat's milk. But when I went to the course, there was no goat's milk. It was it, this halloumi that I was taught to make was purely with cow's milk. The result um, is very similar to the halloumi I remember in Cyprus. But since then, I've practiced making the halloumi with goat's cheese. So I'm experimenting at the moment. Um, I've made it with 100% goat's milk, which we can't get all year round uh, in Australia. And I think perhaps that's one of the reasons I don't use it all the time. And I've ex experimented with 50% goat's milk and 50% cow's milk and at the moment that's the best recipe but the the result uh, is is pretty good and the customers really like it they can tell the difference between the halloumi I make and the halloumi that we buy from the supermarkets so and how does your halloumi behave when you for example fry it or grill it is it better if it has the goat's milk in I think it's better because it's got more of a, a you can actually taste, the, to me, the, what I remember halloumi being, it has actually got a taste. When it's with the cow's milk, it's not got so much flavour, but when you sort of uh, grill it, it's still pretty nice. <laughs> you're back visiting Cyprus after many years, and I'm sure that you're tasting local halloumi while you're here. Can you compare what your homemade product in Australia is with what you get here in Cyprus? I'd, I have to say it is pretty similar. The results, um, it's like anything that's made fresh, it is, um, it's easy to make, but it can easily go wrong. So um, it's all to do with how it's made on the day. And we have a lot of variation in the, the milk from one season to the next in Australia. It's, in the summer, the milk is not so creamy because of what the cows have been eating. And so that is a big difference in the milk. It's uh, creamier, sometimes it's softer. Each batch, really, it's a very individual batch. Uh, so... It's hard to make it completely consistent every time because the milk can be different. Have you ever thought of adding another ingredient, another flavour, to make a, a particular flavoured halloumi? It's something I have thought of, but as I've um, still, I, I feel experimenting with it and experimenting which is the best percentage of goat's milk to to cow's milk. Um, but there's definitely something that you know I will do, you know, as time goes on and I get better at getting the result as I want it. And what about the Yasu Cafe itself? You obviously have a lot of customers who enjoy their Greek or is it Cypriot food. Is that a, a well-known thing in Australia? No, not very well, well known. Um, it's in the country in Western Australia. So it's really, um, there are not many Greek people there. I'd get very few people in. Occasionally somebody comes in and says Yasu and but not very many, so not a lot of people are very aware of, of the traditional halloumi, so they wouldn't really, I guess, know the difference between a goat's. Uh, to me, the, the, there is a big difference. It's just a, a much nicer taste with the goat's halloumi. But Greek or Cypriot food in general, I mean, there's a huge uh, Hellenic population in, in Australia, isn't there? There is, but not in the area that I'm in, and the people are not aware that, that of a lot of the Cypriot or Greek traditions and food, so it's it's quite new. It's, it's, it's all an experiment. And what's your favourite uh, Cypriot dish? Probably halloumi. Yeah, and that's probably why I've I, you know, got the interest in trying to make it myself. Yeah, I really enjoy uh, and remember that very much. Well, it's been a fairly quiet week on the news front, of course, because of the long Easter break. But some of the top stories this week in Cyprus, chaos and tear gas as fans clash, traffic brought to a standstill on the highway as Apoel and Ael fans fought running battles with firecrackers and rocks. One Apoel fan not involved in the clashes has lost an eye after being hit by a rock. And that has got quite a few repercussions and a lot of discussion going in the local press.
With a population of just over one million, Cyprus has, believe it or not, 39 municipalities, most of which are close to bankruptcy. While successive studies have suggested that the number should be cut, a British report recently said that five was the optimum number, and now a new Italian consultation has come out and said 12 would be ideal. Whatever the final number, it's very clear that 39 is way too many, and indeed unsustainable. But no moves have yet been made to reduce the number. Moves are afoot to involve European investors in the development of the island's natural gas resources. I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. And some good news. The 17th annual travel exhibition, Taxidi 2014, opens on Friday. Travel agents are offering reductions on holidays this summer. Online and as a podcast, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Rock legends Deep Purple will be performing a concert in the Turkish-occupied part of Cyprus, despite criticism that the appearance will make a political statement. Nathan Morley spoke to lead singer Ian Gillen, who confirmed that the free public concert will go ahead, but revealed that the band had discussed the possibility of cancelling the performance. Nathan asked if the band accepts all invitations. Yes, pretty much. I mean, there, there's obviously exceptions. I mean, we won't go into a war zone, and um, we we try and get out if, when the earthquakes start and the volcanoes kick off, but... Um, Generally, there's not many places that we wouldn't play, and uh, no, I don't think uh, I don't think uh, you can. I've, I've thought about this so many times in, in 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 the past, and before this ever came up, with other situations when we played in Northern Ireland, when we played in Chechnya, when we played in Pakistan and yeah. um, and China, and played in places in in, in Lebanon and. Uh, and Israel, and I mean, there's so many places, and everyone's there are conflicts all over the place. And I said, well, you know, if we if we, if we play, if we if we turn down gigs where there's conflict, we won't be playing anywhere. And uh, it's not as if we stick to the usual circuit. The Deep Purple is not a band that just plays New York and um, Berlin and London and that sort of thing. Uh, we do literally travel in, in into incredibly remote places too um, not that Cyprus is remote at all but I'm just trying to give you a broad picture of uh, well, from, from where, how, how we look at things and I think the um, overall reaction really was when, when, when we had complaints, I mean we, we do get things like this from time to time I remember getting a very aggressive letter from Brian May saying we shouldn't be playing in Israel um, last year and um you know, you've got to weigh these things up, and uh, so, as I say, it's it's not. We're, we're just playing music. I don't think. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that if I thought in my mind, and if if you can forgive me for speaking purely personally, because that's what we do. We're all different in the band. We're all different politically, and we mm. come from different uh, leanings. But um, so from my point of view, um, I think that the balance would be if I thought it would make a situation worse, then probably I might consider it, because I think is we've got no part in, 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 in stirring things up or, you know, degrading a situation. But in, I see hope always. I'm an optimist. I always see the reaching out of hands. I remember, and you've probably read this, but when I was living in uh, London in, in the early days of the Cold War, when it was at its most frightening, and we were facing mutually assured destruction which was the common phrase then but it was a reality and we all lived under a terrible fear but I still remember the Bolshoi Ballet and the Cossack dancers and you know the top teams from Moscow coming to play football in London and so those cultural and diplomatic and um, sporting doors were left open and I think probably that was a fuse that uh, uh, let off a little bit of attention and as it kept the kept the wheels greased, mm. if you like, with hope for the future. So, I, I don't know, it sounds like a load of waffle, but in, in my mind it makes sense, and as I say, I'm an optimist, and um, 
I love the idea of people shaking hands and embracing each other and putting troubles behind them. So, uh, But this has become a big issue in Cyprus, and there are some that are saying that this gives the Turkish invasion a kind of rubber stamp of approval. I mean, what do you make of all of that? Well, um, I, I, <laughs> I, I certainly do not want to get involved in one side or the other. It's an historical disagreement. And, um, I mean, because of all this, I've read a lot of the history, and so... Uh, but I'm not going to comment on that. But the very fact that invitations and hands are being outreached, you know, you can sense it. it's always easier to say yes than it is to say no. And I, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the positive side of it. Um, yeah, sure, people are going to say, well, people are going to say, well, I'm never going to change my mind. Um, but I'm, I, even now I'm dipping my toes in water where I don't really want to go because we're talking about music here. But in terms of the balance, as I was saying earlier on, it's whether it would do more harm than good. I don't think it will. One final question about Cyprus. Um, did it, at any point, Ian, you think about pulling out? I mean, because we know it's now confirmed, it's going ahead, and the past four mm -hmm. weeks must have been a fairly trying time for you because, uh, the, the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there has been a lot of reaction. Was there, was there a day where you said, hang on, maybe we shouldn't do this? Well, I had a call from the, um, from the management and from the agency and, and communications from the promoter and people involved in this um, when we started receiving communications uh, uh, and um, first of all uh, you know in all of these things but I've tried to explain the situation of our history and where we've done and how we've dealt with this from Northern Ireland right through to some of the more, most remote territories um, all of whom have had their own upsetting and terrible conflicts it's one of those things you think well no I, uh, we can't pull out of this because and we reasoned it through and when when you say did we think about pulling out well of course we thought about it but it was never ever i don't think a question of saying yes we will pull out and one of the reasonings uh, that came to my mind just because you've got to constantly update your rationale with it so you can't be dogmatic about situations like this you've got to constantly justify it to yourself really and i think one of the things that came to mind was, well, look, we play a lot. Uh, we've just finished tours in, in um, played in Kiev and uh, in Moscow and other places in that area. Mm. And just supposing now that we were um, coming up to a, a tour in, uh, in, in to do some dates in Moscow and St. Petersburg, Volgograd or wherever, and uh, the same situation occurred with regard to um, Ukraine. And uh, you're dealing with that whole situation now. Which side do you take? Well, you, the answer is you don't take any side at all. It's none of my business. Um, we're musicians. And hopefully music is an uplifting thing. And so it will act as a positive force. Um, I, that's all I hope for. I don't wish to interfere in anyone's affairs. And I don't wish also uh, for offence to be taken where none is intended. Deep Purple's Ian Gillen talking to Nathan Morley. You can listen anytime, anywhere to the Cyprus News Digest by subscribing to the podcast. Well, the economy is growing perhaps very slightly. We certainly need to engender more growth if we're going to achieve all the things that we want to achieve and get ourselves out of that Troika memorandum. I'm very honoured to be joined by the Minister of Communications to talk about exactly what it is that his ministry can do to help in that business of attracting investors to Cyprus. Can you tell me first what your plan is at the ministry? Because one of the things we've always been good at in Cyprus is communications and of course with the internet and broadband coverage sometimes that's where we fall down particularly in more outlying areas. Have you got plans? Yeah, the Ministry of Communications and Works is basically responsible for the whole infrastructure of the country. Uh, a basic part of the infrastructure is the techno technology infrastructure. As you know, or as you probably know, uh, we're not the country with the fastest internet in the European Union at the moment. Actually, we are, um, I would say, we are behind in, in some aspects. 
Um, I, do, I do believe in technology and I do believe that uh, we should improve our infrastructure. And uh, regarding the broadband, we, as, as a ministry, we have applied for certain programs under the European uh, structural uh, funding because it is our effort to improve the speeds of the internet, uh, both for the home and business networks. So one of these uh, programs, for example, is uh, the program of the last mile. Uh, so we will uh, basically fund the, the fiber optics to convert all the last mile from the house to the switch, from cover lines to fiber optics. And we believe that will improve the, the speeds of the, of the internet. It's not just speed, it's also coverage. As I mentioned, I mean, know that the terrain in Cyprus is not conducive to some of the outlying village areas, for example, to get even decent internet connection, forget speeds, just to have some internet connection. Now, a few years ago, the Ministry was working on an absolutely island-wide coverage, again, I think, with European funding. What's happened to that? First, let me tell you about the, uh, one of the programs we have. We have a, an agreement with Helasat. So as, as part of the agreement to renew the frequency of Helasat, they provide to us coverage in remote areas where we don't have the broadband access via satellite. So we have internet via satellite. And that's one of the programs that is currently being implemented. So we do intend to give access to internet to everybody in Cyprus. Now, regarding the, the rest of the coverage, as you know, we have the main company, the incumbent company, which is the Cyprus Telecommunication Authority, that they practically have uh, coverage of, I would say, more than 95% of the, of the people in Cyprus. Now, for the rest of the companies, they are at the moment building their networks. So if we combine all these initiatives, I believe that we're going to have uh, almost 100% uh, coverage within the next uh, couple of years. Now, the President's been visiting uh, the Near East, the Middle East and so on recently, trying to attract investment. Has he come back to the Ministry of Communications with any particular demands or worries from potential investors as far as our infrastructure for communications goes? Firstly, I would like to say that uh, even though as a ministry we didn't go to the last visit to Abu Dhabi, we provided the people who went there with a presentation of some of the projects that are related to our ministry. And uh, we are currently having some meetings with some of these funds that are coming to Cyprus to see what projects we can do with them. Now, regarding the infrastructure, so I would say that the... Um, they haven't come back with the particular worries about our infrastructure, but what we do need to do in general is basically improve uh, the speed uh, that we do business. Uh, and this is, uh, if somebody wants to do, for example, a, a large project in Cyprus, uh, because of the various uh, bureaucratic procedures we have, it can take, like, um, I would say at least four to five years, and in some cases it even takes ten years to do these projects. So what we definitely need to do in Cyprus is to improve these bureaucratic procedures so as to make it much easier for investors to invest in Cyprus. Which brings us actually to the whole idea of e-government. Again, I'm sure that's something that you're probably very much involved in, but I mean, for example, setting up companies here. All of this ought to be able to be done online because we're no longer an island in the Mediterranean. We're just another blip on the global map if you do everything electronically. So how are you looking at that as a solution to not only attracting investors, but as you say, cutting down the cost, the time and the bureaucracy so that people who want to invest can get in here and do it? Uh, for a start, I have to say that uh, we're talking about a major restructuring of the civil service. If we don't implement the technology part, we're not going to be able to do that. There is currently the e-government project, which is under the Ministry of, of Finance, but my ministry is involved as well. We have a number of e-government projects uh, across the, the whole uh, well, a number of ministries. And basically, uh, what we need to do is, for a start, improve the service for the citizens of Cyprus and anybody who comes to Cyprus, make it much easier for them to get the service from the state, the service that they pay for, in any case, via the taxes and everything. Now, regarding the bureaucratic procedures for somebody who wants to come and invest in Cyprus, I think what we really need to do is we need to understand 
that a lot of people are trying to get investments from these people. So if they come to Cyprus and they want to do a project and they sort of realize that it would probably take like four to five years to do, they would just go somewhere else. So um, technology would definitely um, assist in, in, in making it much easier for these people to get the necessary information, to cut down the bureaucratic procedures to get certain things done. But we also need to change the way we do business, uh, in a sense, even to do that by law. Because now, um, if somebody wants to make an investment in Cyprus, they need to get a, a number of permissions from different ministries. I think what we need to have is to have a central agency that will uh, provide all that to them. A one-stop shop. But a real one-stop shop. And when I say one-stop shop, I don't mean something like the one we have now at SIPA, where people, they go there, and they are being directed to the various ministries where they can get the information. I'm talking about a one-stop shop that would provide a complete and fast solution for the investor. So if the investor thinks of an idea, um, let's say he wants to do a technology park, he should be able to, I mean, if he provides like a, a feasibility study and we are convinced as a government that this is a feasible project, he should be able to implement his project, let's say, within a maximum of 12 months. But the way things are done nowadays in Cyprus, it would probably take him about four to five years. So how far down the road are we in implementing some of these things you've said? Because they aren't new, and it, it is one of this government's priorities, or they said they, it was um, a year ago when they came into power. Have we progressed? I think the government is doing uh, a lot of steps that people that don't realise about them towards this direction. Uh, for a start, I have to say that the... Of course, the difficult task for the government after what happened in, in March was to stabilize the situation of the economy. And I think this government is very well aware of what they need to do to get the, the business basically flowing to Cyprus. And they are, we're kind of, the, I would say, the planning pro process to see how we will implement this because we definitely need to bring investments in Cyprus. And we can see this. Uh, with the efforts that the president is currently doing, visiting all these countries in an effort to generate, uh, generate interest. Of course, there's a difference between generating the initial interest and converting that into actual investments. Especially if people get frustrated by the bureaucracy. That, uh, it's almost a chicken and egg situation. It is. But, of course, it's not only the bureaucracy at the moment that prevents um, some big investments to be made in Cyprus. There are other reasons as well. What about small investors? You know, we are an SME, small and medium-sized mm. enterprise country. That's the backbone of the Cypriot economy, I would suggest. How do the SMEs here use the technology that we do have and, and how much easier could it be made for them? Because they, of course, don't have the same manpower as big corporations when it comes to visiting ministries, filling out forms and paying hefty fees. Yeah, there are, of course, many programs under the Ministry of Commerce, which many of them are funded by the European Union. And they are um, basically directed towards um, giving access to a lot of these SMEs to uh, technology. There are also some programs that aim to give access to funding to these uh, to this companies, SMEs as well. What would probably be a good idea and something we need to think about in the future would be to create a, a type of a fund, like a private equity fund, Maybe, if we can do that, sponsored by the government as well, that will give um, access to equity to some of these SMEs because the essence of uh, developing things like technology, and for example, we say that we want to become a technology hub, but of course to become a technology hub, you have to have a lot of startups. To have a lot of startups, somebody needs to give access to funding to these, uh, to these people and to these businesses. And what many countries are doing at the moment, they are creating these sort of uh, funds private equity type funds that are sponsored by the government that they provide access to funding to these uh, SMEs. Uh, this is probably one of the ideas that we we'll have to consider very actively in Cyprus and maybe we can get the EU to be involved as well because obviously as, as a country we don't have um, a lot of funding at the moment, unfortunately. The Minister of Communications and Works, Marios Dimitriadis.
Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.